presentation on the Senate uh, about climate change, and it's always called Time to Wake Up. So I just thought of that when I realized it's two in the afternoon and everyone's exhausted. It's time to wake up. <laughs> Welcome to the Drinking Water Workshop. My name is Paul Lowenstein. I'll be moderating this session. Uh, this dramatic photo that you see on the screen there is uh, a white sucker trying to spawn in the Jones River in Kingston. Um, it shows what can happen when water withdrawals are excessive. Flow in the Jones River is impacted by Brockton's water withdrawals. We're fortunate today to have several water experts with us as panelists. Margaret Kearns, raise your hand, thank you. Aquatic scientist with Corona Environmental Consulting of Situate. And Al Banger of uh, the Situate Department of Public Works will describe their collaboration to strike a better balance between human and environmental needs for water and situate, especially the restoration of the Herring Run and First Herring Brook. Bethany Carr, Assistant Commissioner of the Bureau of Water Resources at the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection, will explain how the state's sustainable water management initiative will ensure adequate supplies of high quality drinking water while protecting the environment. Finally, Bill Napolitano, um, well, uh, uh, Environmental Program Director of the Southeast Regional Planning and Economic Development District, otherwise known as SERPED, will uh, discuss ways to ensure economic vitality without overtaxing our vital and finite water resources. Following the presentations, there will be an opportunity for questions from the audience. Okay, uh, this map um, was developed in conjunction with the state sustainable water management initiative uh, and shows the widespread impact of well pumping in southeastern Massachusetts. The areas shown in pink and red represent groundwater withdrawal categories four and five respectively on a scale of one to five where one is the least impacted by water withdrawals and five is the most impacted by water withdrawals. Clearly, water withdrawals are significantly impacting the environment in many areas of southeastern Massachusetts. There are no data for the areas shown in white on Cape Cod primarily. Presumably, some of those are also impacted by water withdrawals. I would like to tell you about the water conservation program in my hometown of Sharon. As you can see uh, from the area on this map, Sharon's water resources are significantly impacted by well pumping. Residential water use in Sharon has been reduced by over 20% since the 1990s, saving over 100 million gallons per year, despite a 6% increase in population since 1995. Sharon's water conservation program has received two awards from the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection as well as a national award from the Environmental Protection Agency. Is Nancy Filer still here anywhere? Maybe she took off. She was here this morning. She's our water conservation coordinator. Does a tremendous job. Goes into the schools. Um, Sharon's four-part water conservation program is simple and effective. First, steeply ascending block water rates provide an incentive to conserve. Second, Generous rebates of $200 for high efficiency toilets and washing machines help residents use water efficiently. Third, use of automatic lawn irrigation systems is restricted to two hours twice per week, odd even. 
And fourth, public outreach in the form of water belt inserts, education in the public schools, and the efforts of a part-time water conservation coordinator, Nancy Fowler, um, raises awareness about the economic and environmental benefits of conserving water. Sharon's deeply ascending block water rates cover the full cost of providing the community with water while providing a strong incentive to conserve. In winter, water for essential domestic use costs only $3 per thousand gallons, whereas heavy water use costs up to $12 per thousand gallons. In summer, when the town's water resources are most stressed, water rates are higher, ranging from $4 per thousand gallons for essential use up to $13.50 for heavy use. Keeping the fixed fee low means that most of the water bill is based on actual water usage. Sharon's water conservation costs about $60,000 per year, mostly for rebates and the salary of the part-time water conservation coordinator. This cost is more than the offset by the savings of about $70,000 worth of electricity to pump the wells and chemicals to treat the water. Using water more efficiently has also helped Sharon avoid the multi-million dollar cost of importing supplementary water from MWRA. Reduced demand improves drinking water quality by allowing the water department to pump water only from the wells with the best water quality. Sharon's motto is, a better place to live because it's naturally beautiful. Sharon has about 6,000 homes with a median value of approximately $450,000. So the total value of Sharon's residential real estate is about $2.7 billion. A 1% dip in that number due to environmental degradation or inferior drinking water quality would equate to $27 million. That's about nine times more than the $3 million budget of the Sharon Water Department. Sharon's reduction in water use is also keeping over 100 tons of CO2 out of the atmosphere every year. Despite its progress with water conservation, Sharon could do a lot better. If everyone in Sharon used water as efficiently as the 500 most water efficient households, total water use in Sharon could be cut almost in half. The same methods that worked in Sharon were applied in Georgetown through a grant from the Department of Environmental Protection with similar results. Now we'll hear from Margaret Kearns about her collaboration with the Situate DPW to restore First Hearing Book. All right, can you hear me now? So I've had the uh, good fortune to be asked to talk to you today about a project that's actually good news regarding drinking water and quantity in Massachusetts, and I think they're still out ahead of the curve on a lot of these um, types of issues in, in Massachusetts. One more. All right. So we're going to talk about First Hearing Brook in Situate, Massachusetts. Uh, First Hearing Brook is a small coastal stream. It empties out into the North River estuary. It's about a six square mile watershed, and it's the main source of drinking water for the town of Situate. Uh, you can see on the map, there's in the red circles, Tack Factory Pond, and then downstream of that, Old Open Bucket Pond. These are the two main reservoirs for the town's drinking water. Those uh, blue blobs are uh, groundwater wells, so you can see there's a number of groundwater wells also within the same area. Um, and they do have some wells outside of the First Herring Park watershed as well. Uh, now this project got going in the, initially because uh, residents in town had formed a watershed association, First Herring Brook Watershed Initiative, and they were interested in looking at how much water was coming into their drinking water system because there's a lot of growth in town. Um, they're worried that they're going to run out of water, but no one had really ever measured how much was coming in. Uh, so they got out and they started looking at uh, stream flow. Um, and what they noticed is that the way the town had been managing the reservoirs was really to maximize uh, drinking water for the population and that it was having some impacts on the uh, aquatic resources in the stream. So in between Tack Factory Pond and Old Oak and Bucket, they were basically shuttling water from Tack Factory Pond, where there's more storage, down to Old Oak and Bucket Pond, where the water treatment plant and the withdrawal point is. So there were times when there was no flow in the river, there were times when the flow changed really rapidly, um, and then out downstream of Old Oak and Bucket Pond, the water wasn't coming out um, in the summer, and they weren't really managing, even though there was a fish ladder there, they weren't particularly managing it to allow the herring to come in and out. And so as a result, the herring uh, had declined. So people had seen herring back in the 80s, and I haven't seen them since then. So that's basically the, the problem that was, uh, they were uh, challenged with. 
Um, a group came together, the goals of the project were to provide adequate stream flow um, seasonally for native aquatic species, effectively operate the fish ladders to restore herring, and to meet situation water needs. Um, and I'm trying to talk over um, 10 years of history of this project, so in the interest of time, I'm just going to say a lot of people have been involved, this taken, <laughs> and a lot of people in this room have been involved, in fact. Um, I stole somebody's slide, and I hope you're honest. <laughs> So the group that got together um, really thought outside the box and thought of a lot of possible solutions to how could we potentially fix this problem. They looked at everything from different seasonal stream flow releases to water conservation and water restrictions. They looked at different fishway designs. They looked for locations for the groundwater wells, um, different ways to manage the flows of the fish ladders, um, and also uh, engineering responses like um, dredging the reservoir or raising the level of the reservoir um, to uh, allow more water storage. And so no one of these really solved the problem. It's a very small watershed, um, and so there was, just wasn't a lot of play, and given the amount that they were already needing. Uh, but we started looking at them in combination. You can imagine if you're looking at all of these different things, in there are a lot of combinations <laughs> that's possible. And we ran about almost 100 scenarios until we came up with a plan that seemed like it was going to work. Um, so the plan was really two parts. There was an interim plan that addressed getting fish into Old Oak and Bucket Pond and restoring some stream flow. And then there was a long-term plan to get the fish all the way up to the reservoir where there's more habitat for the herring. So the interim operating plan has minimum stream flows. It had a, um, a provision to shut off water completely when there's a severe drought. Um, it, it included um, guidance on how to operate the fish ladder at Old Oak and Bucket Pond. Um, it included some updates that the water uh, department had made. They had rehabilitated a few wells and they had fixed some leaks. Um, and it included an irrigation system restriction that I was going to talk about in more detail. And it included um, a level at which they would have a total outdoor water fan put on. And with this operating plan, they were able to maintain seasonal flows. They were able to operate the fish ladder below the bucket. And so this is the fish ladder you're looking at right here. And the good news, and the slide that I stole from Sarah Grady at North and South River Swatch Association, is that the herring came back. Um, this was a little bit unexpected even in the first year, which was, I think, 2012, right? Uh, because herring is thought to go back to their natal streams, and there's only, you know, it's thought to be there's only a few that are out there straying into new territory. And so it was nice to see that they were actually coming back to the stream where we know they hadn't been born, because there hadn't been, you know, herring seen here in, in many years. Um, and they've continued to see the herring coming back uh, year after year, not in high numbers, um, but at least a few. I don't know, you have the latest number on your tip of your tongue, Sarah? <laughs> um, I don't know anything. I don't think we've seen any fish this year. It hasn't exceeded about a dozen. For, uh, for the past That's year. small, but it's a first. I'm sorry. We can lay a lot of eggs. But if the last year we had a herring get through Old Open Bucket and try to go up into the reservoir, so that was a yeah, it was a very exciting one, because the way the, the fish ladder was built on the reservoir, it was it was intended that the reservoir would be operated at a much higher water level, and, and we didn't really think it was possible for the fish to get up the ladder the way it's configured right now. So it was pretty exciting to see what's trying to make it up there. Um, so the long-term plan is to be able to allow the fish to get up there without you know, having to be like that one in a million fish who can, who can leave small buildings in a single bound. <laughs> <laughs> so the long-term plan includes um, raising the water level at the reservoir by one foot. Um, so there's some engineering plans in the works um, to do that. Uh, yep. And uh, the fishway exit elevation needs to come down a few feet so that the hardest part was to get the herring out, the juvenile herring out in the fall because the reservoir level drops over the summer as the town uses water. You know, you imagine the fish ladder is right here, the reservoir water level is here, you're not going to get the fish out because they don't have to leap over you know, the, the, the entrance to the, to the reservoir. So they need to make some changes to the actual uh, fishway itself. Um, they were able to come up with a way to reduce the flow that's needed in the fish ladder in order to get the fish out. Um, and then they're tinkering some more with the irrigation season and the water bed and trigger elevation to try and fine tune um, the plan. And one of the interesting things, um, and I think probably one of the necessary things that's happened in this project is as the group has worked together, they've formed sort of relationships, and it's really been an, uh, you know, a case in adaptive management where we came up with the initial plan, the water department tried to implement it, um, you know, they had to make some changes and tweaks and you know, found out that, oh, maybe we're not as comfortable with this as we thought, and let's, let's rethink. Um, and so I think that the, the process of Going back and monitoring how, how your success is coming along and, and what's still a challenge is really important and it's something that the group has really done very well. Um, and that's it. Many, many thanks to all of you and all of you in the room who have uh, participated in this project. Thank you very much, Margaret. I guess uh, Al, if you want to take over, you were a couple minutes behind, so I won't ask questions at this point. Here we go. First of all, I have to tell you, I'm a hack. 
Okay, I'm not really a long-term DPW director. I did the job for five years, so I'm actually a serial retiree. <laughs> I came from private industry, retired, worked on the town's MBTA project, retired. Uh, the DPW job was there. I thought I might have one more in me, so I took that for two years, became five and a half. Uh, I retired again, thank you. Um, and now I do special projects for the town. It's uh, a town municipal government is a little bit like the mob. Once they get their hands on you, you cannot get away. <laughs> so that's the way it is. Um, Sitchman is a town of about 18,000 residents. We have around seven to eight, about 8,000 uh, homes or residences. Uh, our town grows a bit in the summer. Um, and we have had water restrictions every summer, um, notwithstanding uh, trying to keep the herring flowing, but rather just to run out of water. So we had a human species problem as well as a, a uh, environmental problem. And uh, of course, to follow this will be inadequate flows in the first herring growth. Um, so I began looking at that. And I, I was looking for, uh, as a result of uh, discussions with uh, NW, uh, North South River Watershed Association, Samantha, who's kind of like a bulldog. Once she gets into you, she'll never let go of you. <laughs> uh, and I asked her once, well, you know, really, honestly, why do I care about the herring? I mean, I have to supply water for people. We have to make a budget. We're an enterprise, so, you know, we, we just can't go over spend a budget at all. We, we, or else we have to raise rates. And she pointed out the relationship between the herring and the, as a feedstock and what's that doing uh, for the ocean fishery and we're a fishing town. And so that all made some sense. And I could figure out the nexus and how I could sell the story in town about if we worked on restoring the herring, that would be good for us as well. Because in the political environment, you have to balance both sides of it. You know, you talk to the selectmen and you emphasize one story. You talk to the environmental people, you emphasize the same story, but with a different slight coloration. So what I looked at was, uh, who's using our water anyway? And this chart fairly dramatically shows, if you take the top 200 users uh, and look at the periodic cycle over a two year period, the hubs obviously being the summertime. And then you look at the middle 200 users over that same two year period, you can see the lower line uh, indicates how much water they use. Yeah, there's a little bump in the summer. But you have to say that first of all, our biggest residential users are using about four times as much water on average. And in the summer, that goes up to about eight times as much water. Where is that coming from? Well, looking at the addresses, you can figure out where that's coming from. It's coming from summertime irrigation. So what we did was we put in place, a, for the first year, a set of irrigation restrictions uh, that would limit the use of an irrigation system between Memorial Day and Labor Day to one day a week. This is a lawn irrigation system. This is so people can still use a hose to water some bushes or water their garden, but you cannot use your lawn install lawn irrigation system except that one day a week. And we're going to assign you the day of the week based upon the voter district in which the residence is located. And what was the impact? It reduced, first of all, it reduced our reliance upon pond water. Pond water in situate tastes pondy. <laughs> well water tastes good. Well water uh, requires less chemical treatment. It's good to go right out of the ground, more or less. Um, and because we ended up using less well water in that summer of our irrigation restriction, uh, we ran the treatment plant a lot less. That reduced. Uh, by 19% our THM and HAA residuals, which are byproducts of water treatment, as you know. The impact on our customer service was we were able to run our system at a much lower pressure. Well, how would that be? Well, pressure is determined by how much water you put in the water tank. We fill up the water tank all night long in anticipation that about 4 a.m., what we call the sprinkler curve would hit when all the sprinklers would go on and the water tank would drop down so that by the time people got up in the morning, pressures were low and we were in danger of being able to fight fires in town because we have to maintain a certain head in, in the event, in the unfortunate event of a fire. So we were able to not have to fill the tank as full, therefore our water pressures were lower. We had 23% fewer water breaks and 25% fewer brown water complaints. 
which I can explain wrong if you really want to know what that is. Uh, we avoided that summer a water time ban, a uh, water ban, which would have been across all residents, which enabled people who were used conserving by sprinkling only one day a week, but they could still sprinkle one day a week. All four neighboring towns had to go on water bans that same summer. Then we had to do a survey um, because the selectmen were concerned, well, how do people feel about this? And, you know, who talks to the select persons? The ones who were maybe feel less better by the, by the rule, who were impinged by the rule, okay? <laughs> so the selectmen would get four complaints and that would constitute a big deal. So we did a survey. We sent out with the water bill um, a postage paid survey that asked the question, uh, how do you feel about the summertime irrigation ban? Um, should we continue it? Should we stop it? Should we modify it? 82% of the residents responded, yes, continue to limit the use of in-ground lawn irrigation systems, which we thought was a huge win. As a result, the selectmen made that standing. This is now not just a one-year test. It is now then in our water regulations. This is how, you, how we run every summer. Our operation ran better. Less demand was placed in the treatment plant. We reduced the amount of wear and tear, uh, less overtime operation, lower power consumptions, fewer chemicals were used. Uh, on the environment, we were obviously less reliant upon our service water because we used more of our well water. We, retain, we did maintain better stream flows. Margaret talked about some of the impact of that. We reduced our carbon footprint and the number of chemicals we used and we eliminated the very unsightly look of an empty reservoir right on Route 3A, which is right in the heart of town. Here's the summary of what I've said. I'm not going to read them all off. And we achieved our, our target of 65 gallons per day per person. And the epilogue of this is that in the fall, this last fall, the Board of Selectmen in their role as water commissioners passed a regulation prohibiting any future connections of lawn irrigation systems to the municipal water supply. And right now, as the recession is turning around, we're seeing a tremendous uh, number of new building permits for single family residences, uh, 200 home condominium complexes, uh, Toll Brothers um, uh, property for uh, 100 uh, very nice homes along the coast. Uh, and we anticipated all of those would have water irrigation systems and we wouldn't have enough water to supply the residents as well as the irrigation system, not even to speak of the uh, watershed. So the selectmen stepped up to the bar as a result of uh, our Water Resources Committee recommendation that we're prohibiting all future connections of irrigation systems to our water supply. Bravo. <laughs> Great, thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, so what I want to talk to you about is the Water Management Act and the Sustainable Water Management Initiative, uh, which falls right in line with what uh, Margaret and Al have been speaking about now. Uh, the Water Management Act is the law in Massachusetts that governs water withdrawals that are greater than 100,000 gallons per day. There are two categories of how we regulate these withdrawals. Uh, the first is registrations, which are essentially grandfather, grandfathered water withdrawals uh, that were uh, happening between uh, in the mid-1980s when the law was passed. And so we do not regulate uh, registered volumes. What we do regulate and uh, through permits, so this is the second category, permits, are uh, withdrawals that were not considered to be grandfathered and are greater than 100,000 gallons per day. So uh, we have this law and we had a set of regulations on the books um, and for a lot of reasons we decided we really needed to take a hard look at those regulations and make some improvements. You might not think about, or maybe we do now think about, but over the, the years we might not have worried so much about water quantity issues in Massachusetts. We get 44 inches of precipitation a year. It seems as though we have ample water, but uh, when we look at um, peak storms and having severe weather events, we know that we have uh, uh, increases in flow followed by, by decreases in, in water availability, especially in the summertime when um, uh, precipitation uh, is, is not happening as much and, and use is high. 
Um, we also had a lot of legal challenges associated with our regulations. And so um, on one hand, uh, we were ordered by the court to go back and look at the safe yield, which I'll talk about a bit. Um, and so we, while we had that opportunity and in the midst of all this controversy, we really decided to take a step back, um, collect more information, use some more science, and see if we could come up with a better way um, to regulate water withdrawals in the Commonwealth. So that process went on uh, for about five years. Um, I'm looking around the room and I see a lot of the stakeholders that were involved in those discussions. Um, and it's not easy. So uh, Al, when you were talking about balancing um, what people are looking for, I, I know uh, full well what, what it takes to try to uh, balance, strike that right balance. On the one hand, uh, we have public water suppliers whose, whose job and mission is to make sure that citizens of the Commonwealth have the water they need to meet their needs. Um, on the other hand, we have um, watershed groups and advocates who are concerned about how those uh, uh, withdrawals impact the environment and fish habitat. Um, and there's a lot of a lot of gray in the middle and um, a lot of places where um, those groups have the same goals for sure and we really needed to try to find um, how we could meet all of those goals but it was not easy um, so over the the five years and hundreds of uh, stakeholder meetings um, what did we come up with um, first we wanted to make sure that our goal was focused on making sure that we could provide water that could support long-term uh, growth and economic development while also mitigating any impacts associated with those water withdrawals to the environment. A very tall order, as folks in this room can appreciate. Um, before I go further, I do want to note um, that while I was a, a part of this, um, as were many of you, many of the stakeholders um, that were here, both from representing public water suppliers um, and advocates uh, and others, um, we also have a, a very important uh, staff at DEP who is working very hard. So I want to note that Dwayne Levanji is here um, with two folks on his staff, Julie Butler and Shi Chen. Um, and so uh, they did, uh, I want to say, most of the heavy lifting and will continue to do so as we get into implementing these regs. And I'll talk about that in a minute. So uh, the, reg, the key components of the regs are a safe yield, which is established on a basin-wide scale. There are 28 major basins in the Commonwealth, and we establish a safe yield. Um, for those basins. We also are looking at a sub-basin scale at stream flow criteria. And so the map that Paul had up in the beginning that had all the, the red and pink colors, which were the groundwater withdrawal categories, um, four and five, where we're seeing the most impact, um, we're looking at impacts on that much, much smaller sub-basin scale. And we've also established a baseline, uh, a baseline above which, uh, withdrawals above which a baseline for each permittee uh, will have to be mitigated. And so I want to talk a little bit about how I think that will work. Um, we're looking at minimizing impacts uh, to, to the environment in areas that are those fours and fives. Um, and that involves looking at things like, how could you do um, optimization of the system? Maybe withdraw from this well more than that well. Maybe that will help minimize the impacts of that withdrawal. Looking at the impacts to cold water fishery resources and making sure that we're doing everything we can um, to minimize those types of impacts. And then we're also looking at mitigation. So withdrawals above a certain baseline have to be mitigated. And so what kinds of things help to mitigate those impacts? Um, efforts that put water back into the ground. So that whole conversation that we had on the previous panel about stormwater and the MS4 permit, those types of best management practices are things that are also good for this program too and that we want to be able to give credit for to communities that are doing um, those good things. Uh, we're also looking at things like dam removal um, and other uh, water efficiency practices that help minimize the and, and mitigate the impacts of those withdrawals. Um, we also know, and one of the big things that we heard in our process was that municipalities and public water suppliers are very concerned about cost, just as they are in the MS4 world, they are in this world as well. And so uh, we can't ignore that. Um, and so when we look at, and the way we drafted our regulations is to make sure that we had an element that contemplates impacts of cost and whether an activity is feasible. And so we're, we're figuring out um, how we will, we will make that work as well. So in terms of where are we today after uh, a long five years and a lot of work putting, putting this package together, which I really do believe strikes a very good balance. Um, and of course, the devil will be in the details as we look to start implementing these regulations this year. But the good news is they were finalized and they were promulgated in November 2014. Um, so the regs are available for you to see. There's also a companion guidance document um, that talks about how we plan to implement these regulations. 
Um, and the first round of permits uh, will be starting in 2015. So in Massachusetts, when we implement this program, um, permits are issued on a basin-wide scale, so we don't do everybody all at once. Thank goodness, <laughs> as we're trying to uh, try this new program. So there are two basins um, up for renewal in 2015. They are the South Coast Basin and uh, the Cape. And so what we're doing as we start to plan for implementation is doing outreach consultation meetings on a basin-wide scale. Um, the staff have already done quite a few of those um, for the basins that are up first in 2015 and 2016. These are opportunities not only for public water suppliers who are permittees to come kind of get the overview of the regs and talk in more specifics about their system, but also for others who have who want to learn about this, who have um, information that might be useful to also participate and be a part of the discussion. Um, so as I said, there were two, two basins that will start permitting in 2015. Um, we also have some work to do to the legislature. Um, you know, there was a lot of interest in these regulations as we were drafting them, um, not only um, through, the, through the administration, both uh, the previous administration and now um, the baker Polito administration, but also a lot of legislators were getting questions and concerns um, on both sides from their constituents. And so um, we are also due to write a report to the legislature in 2017 that talks about impacts of cost and, and the work that we're doing on implementation. So we'll be doing updates, of course, for our commissioner and secretary on that as we start to make progress. Um, some of the good news is that we've also had the opportunity to um, uh, issue some grants uh, to communities um, who and, and advocacy groups who are working on these efforts. So we have, this is our third year of grants, um, and so we've uh, issued nearly $3 million over the, over the three years, and I've, you know, 20 or 30 projects, Dwayne, I'm, I'm looking at you. Um, and I know um, the town of uh, Situate was uh, able to receive one of those grants, and, and that's great. We want to learn more. We, you know, this is not something that we, we, you know, established our regs and now we're done. We have more work to do. The guidance is constantly being reviewed as we learn what types of mitigation activities uh, work and how they work and how we should credit them. Um, so this is an ongoing process. So we are, um, we know we're, we're being watched carefully and we want to make sure we do it right. And so we are being very cautious as we um, move through the, the first permits. But um, I hope all of you will, will stay tuned to those efforts um, and certainly happy to answer any questions. But thanks for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Beth. And now Bill uh, Napolitano, survey. Well, um, I'm Bill Napolitano. I'm from Southeast Regional Planning and Economic Development District, CERPED. Uh, much like Martin Pillsbury, who's been a longtime colleague, <laughs> uh, I'm a regional planner. Um, maybe unlike, I am a department of one at my agency. I do the environmental work. So I've surmised that over 30 years and uh, a raft of lateral uh, promotions, I've become the director of environmental programs. Uh, there, there's, there's advantages to it. Staff meetings are quick. We usually reach a consensus even more quickly. Um, I, I usually get to work with a lot of people that make me a better planner. And just, just for the heck, of it, how many people in this room have worked with me before in any way, shape, or form? Grants, whatever, showing hands? I would like to thank you all profusely because you, you are, you have been my colleagues and you have made me a better planner and you have enabled me to work on some excellent projects over the last 30 years. And that's what it's all about. You know, when you talk about how we're going to survive this, you know, th this crisis, and if you notice, not to, um, you know, be smart my colleagues, but I am the only one up here, up here without a glass of water. Why I am conserving as we speak. <laughs> and I'm only hoping that the water that's and it's Margaret's for charity, so I'm only hoping that the water that's coming out here isn't being poured from bottles in the back. We don't know. But it, that gets to the point of my talk, too. Um, Paul was asking me about certain organizations. You know, as a regional planner, I've had an opportunity to work with a bunch of great organizations doing all kinds of conservation. And going on at this point in the day, too, you have the opportunity to really listen to what key words have been in previous talks. And you've heard stewardship ownership, conscience. These are not planning terms. This is in bylaws, rules, regulations, structure. They all imply that there is a genuine, heartfelt interest in the subject. And the people that I've worked with, if you notice the write-up, um, they mentioned the Canoe River Aquifer Advisory Committee. I've also worked over the years with the Matapoisa River Aquifer Advisory Committee. 
uh, the Plymouth Copper Aquifer Advisory Committee. And there are many committees that you all know if you've worked with municipal government, a volunteer on committee, whatever, they come and go. A lot of times it's with a political will. I've, I've seen selectmen and mayors when committees get too close to coming to the truth, they, well, you've served your term, you've done well, and we no longer need you, so I'm discharging the committee. You, you, can, you can join other committees within the town. Well, one of the things that really make the committees that I just mentioned effective is the fact that there was interest. They, start, I'll start with the matter of and this goes back, I also have no slides. Did you notice I have no technology? I have something to say about technology later, but <laughs> this is from the old days. This is old school because I am old school. This was hand laid out, hand printed, and 1,500 of them folded by me because <laughs> The Manapoisa River Valley Aquifer Committee needed something. They needed something. They came to me. We need a public outreach and education tool. What can we do? And I said, you need something that can go home with everybody. So we put this together. And uh, one of the things I'd asked Paul to bring, I'd spoken to Paul quite a bit before the conference, and hopefully you're not all sitting on them, you pick them up. There were um, handouts, I believe, that you put in with the Georgetown Water Bills that you developed. And, and you didn't lose this in your introduction, but when Paul told me about this, I said, you know, that is so important. I said, that may be the most important piece of information that people get out of this whole drinking water session that we're doing, is the fact that you can hand something to people not to tell them that this is why you're doing it, this is what I'm telling you to do, this is what you should do, I am your conscience, this is what you should do, but I want you to know about the water in your community. This is how it's priced. This is how it's used. This is how it impacts you. I want you to learn and become interested. I want you to be invested in this idea. I want you to own it. I don't want to have to own you and be your conscience. I mean, I'm sure Paul could be the conscience of Sharon, the conscience of Georgetown, the conscience of Newbury Report if he wanted, but it'd probably be a 24-7 job. And we can't do that. One of the things that makes for effective planning, too, is you have to realize that we're here as regional planners not to plan at people, but to plan with people. If people ask me for models, I need a model bylaw for this, I need a model bylaw for that, I need this, I need that in your regulation. Why do you need it? My first question is, why do you need it? What have you thought of? What problem are you trying to solve? What should we talk about? And then when I go, it's always like, well, we were having a committee meeting tonight, we brought Bill Napolitano, he's an expert on this. And I said, whoa, 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 step right there. I said, I am not an expert on anything. I said, I am here to work with you, to plan with you, because you are the experts. You know your town, you know your needs, you know your politics, you know what you're trying to do with your town. Hopefully you have a vision for your town, for growth, planning, water use, conservation, whatever it is. So. You are the experts. I will work with you. You can give me information. We can discuss ideas. I will come back to you. And these ideas will be yours. You will own them. I will help you go out to the public and present these ideas in public. Because what you want to do is not walk away with saying, we're doing what Serpent told us to do. You're doing what you wanted to do, and Serpent helped facilitate that. Because if it doesn't work that way, the idea will die. That's why these guys, the Canoe River, they've been meeting every month. At one time it was every month, now it's every other month, for the past 28 years. 28 years. And Wayne Southworth, who was the Eastern Water Department water superintendent at the time and the, direct, the president, is still active even in his retirement. So you guys, you, you water guys in retirement, I guess you have to stay active pretty much. <laughs> but you know what, my theory is... You started when you were 16. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, uh, we'll cut around to run time if you have any... Just quick. Remarks. Uh, this, these guys started in 1980 out of their own interest. The Plymouth Copper Aquifer Soul Source started in 1991, local interest. They're an intermittent group. I'm going to try to get them back, back to going. They lost actually people who were key. And probably the most, even, I think you're from Scott Horsley later on, and this is kind of an aside too. There was a 20 river watershed study done through a coalition of partners, including Bridgewater State University, 
when we were trying to solve problems with the Tom River Basin, and a lot of it, um, Eric alluded to before. These, these things have been going on for a long time. But they talked about water deficits, you know, water deficits and water surplus areas, and using all the input with, um, with groundwater, with MPDS in, input, surface water withdrawals, a whole bit. They kind of came up with a model. But the key is here. The planning documents that we come up with are to provide you guys and your towns with what I call simple truths and profound clues. You can use this information in the best way possible, but it's up to you to use them, to have the interest to use them. And I'll take questions, and it's a whole bunch. Thank you very much, Bill. Uh, thanks to all our panelists. Uh, and I will open it up to questions. I'll run a little short of time. Yes, in the back. Uh, this, is, this is for Al. You, you mentioned how you identified the, the um, domestic, the, ho the personal houses. You mentioned how you identified the high users from residential houses. Did you identify high users among industry? And if so, who were they? And what, how do you manage that? I'm thinking specifically of golf courses. We have, we have no industry. Oh. <laughs> so Car wash. We, we have uh, several um, you know, high user um, homes such as um, um, nursing homes, uh, restaurants, we have several, we have commercial accounts, so we can separate those out. So it's just really it's the list of uh, like 8,000 users and go through it tediously and begin saying, okay, this is a restaurant, this is a nursing home, uh, and then narrowed it down to the residential area and yeah. associated with each account is an address. Um, and so once you just make an Excel spreadsheet and go through all that, you can come up with a list of addresses and pretty soon you know what you're dealing with. Right, so so it was restaurants and nursing homes were your high users? No, we, we excluded restaurants and oh, you excluded all, them. all those. Yeah, we only looked at, we looked at just residential areas. Oh, I see, so you don't know the answer to that question because, because you didn't look at that. Right, well, we don't have a lot of restaurants either. I mean, so, oh. you know, it's, a, it's just pretty much a residential town. Uh, yeah. So we were able to separate out non-residential users and focus on residential users. Uh, commercial users, we can influence eyeball to eyeball. Uh, residential, when you get down to a higher numbers, then you have to do it more globally. Thank you, Al. Uh, other questions for our panelists? We have a couple minutes left. Um, I just have, what, do you have a question? Ah, yes, go ahead. I would just like to hear about some of the political challenges you faced in Georgetown and to, situ uh, to, to get to a really aggressive water conservation. You would, huh? <laughs> uh, the, well, basically what we had to sell, what the idea was that, that we have, you know, you look at the history of the municipal water system, where does it come from? It comes from the need to supply a uh, source of water for healthy human use, for human health and protection, and you need to supply a source of water for firefighting. Everything else after that is gravy that's been added over the years. So we had to get everybody back to the basics of providing water for human safety, health, and for um, safety. And I think that, that began to swing it. You know, it was, it was a, there were a lot of meetings. So we have a very effective water resources committee that the selectmen appointed. Uh, they respect the members of that committee. So we were able to use the citizen committee talking to the selectmen as well as the hirelings talking with the selectmen. And uh, they respected uh, everything they were getting, but they had to weigh the consequences of the neighbors. You know, all selectmen and women are, uh, you know, coach little league teams and everything else. And so they get approached in all those settings. And, you know, so they have a very difficult job to do. So they had to have some compelling information to be able to talk at the ball field with someone who's leaning on them. And I, I would add to that, Al, that uh, I went up and uh, supervised the Georgetown project, and the first thing that I did was establish a citizen a water committee. And I think it's very important if the town is serious about, you know, water use efficiency, to have a citizen advisory committee made up of people who know something about maybe some engineers or whatever people who, and maybe some environmentalists. It could be a cross section of the community, you know, a representative cross section that will uh, sit once a month 
and hash out a lot of these issues and make recommendations to the selectmen or the water commissioners or whatever who may have other priorities, you know, so. Yeah, I was just going to mention that that Water Resources Committee was actually revived. It was one of those committees that had fallen, fallen out of favor, been disbanded, I don't know what the story was, but it was actually revived for this, for this project and it was really key in moving things forward. I have one more thing with all of this too. We never have been talking about this all day too. Integrated water management, that's, that's how we're really going to make water. To, to cope with the future. Everything that was being talked about before, especially if you combine all the talks, um, whenever it got to the point of climate change and sea level rise, and you realize how flat the basins are, and especially like the Tongue River Basin, we drop um, 20 feet over 40 miles. Yeah. So if you have six inches of sea level rise coming up the gut of the Tongue River, you could affect things for a half mile either side. So there are your wastewater treatment plants, there are some of your wells, there's a lot of your agriculture. So you really have to think about how you can use water, reuse water, capture water. You know, water harvesting isn't just for the West or the Southwest. Uh, we should start planning now. And don't be afraid to have a broad vision. You really have to have a broad vision. It's up to you. It has to come from you. The passion has to come from you, citizens. Yes, one more question. Actually, I'm going to address this. I, I am one of the Water Resource Committee members in Citroën, and I have to give Al a lot of credit uh, by slides, and figures and even really, really um, influential support only goes so far. And one of the things that worked in our favor was Mother Nature in that over the amount of time that we were trying to educate ourselves and educate our boards like we our citizens, uh, we had a terrible drought. Our reservoir got lower and lower and lower and lower. And again, all the citizens see that regularly and all the selectmen see that regularly, as well as the fact that we a town that's over 350 years old, our water pipes are of various ages depending on what part of the town it develops. And we were losing a lot of valuable water through leaks and pipe um, degradation. So that we're currently replacing some pipes. Every time we have a fire, anybody who lives in the vicinity of the fire opens their tap and has brown water. Anytime there was an accidental main break where maybe a contractor cracked a pipe, everybody within a mile of that main without ground water. You could not have asked for a more uh, influential <laughs>
confluence of events because you know we we try and try and try to educate people, but frankly, terrible summer and brown water did a lot of my for us. Thank you for those comments, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> um, Is that true? Uh, yes. I mean, it's, I it's, really good it's, job, right? it's wonderful to hear from somebody on the front lines who's actually a citizen donating their time to addressing our vital and finite water resources. Thank you very much.